All righty, it's good to be back. Away for a couple weeks of a, kind of a sabbatical rest time, and highly recommend if you can ever get away, just in that kind of quality time with the Lord, you do it. But anyway, we've been talking about conflict resolution about how to get along. How many ever wish we could just all get along? We got the old song by who? Who is it that sang? Why can't we be friends? Yeah. Three Dog Night? Yeah. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Anyway, how many just love conflict? Wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, it's well, conflict is is a way of life. It's something we're going to have to learn to deal with. It's not if it happens, but when it happens. How are we going to deal with it? We don't like, didn't much care when we weren't Christians, did we? Mm -hmm. Have a conflict, we just go ahead and put the gloves on and knock each other out, or we just go find somebody else. And uh, that was the way I dealt with it. As soon as there was a little bit of conflict in anything, it was time to find a new relationship. Well, the devil loves to feed on unresolved conflict. One verse in the Bible says that a uh, house divided against itself can't stand when two people are trying to live in the same house and they're divided. Unless two men are in agreement, how can they walk together, Amos says. So before two people can really walk together, they can love each other but not like each other, but there has to be some common ground. There has to be a, a, a place of, of resolving issues so that we can learn to live in harmony. And so the devil loves division. He loves to divide a husband and wife. He loves to divide co-workers. He delight, loves to divide, divide, divide. And then when he divides you up and got you offended and got your feelings hurt and get you separated, then he can conquer you. But a cord of three strands is not easily broken, as uh, Ecclesiastes says, right? It says two are better than one. When one struggles or is cold, the other can keep warm. When one's warm and the other's cold, we can, and vice versa. And that's why God puts two people together to be married anyway. Because two people are better than one, if you got the right fit. If you equally, what's that word, uh, evenly yoke. And so even in a marriage, you can love people and, uh, you know, you can not pretend to like them, but you can learn how to get along. You can learn how to resolve things in a healthy way. The devil loves to divide and conquer, but God is all about relationships. As a matter of fact, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our scripture we've been talking about is Romans 12, 18. I don't think I have that one. Can't even read them. 12 18 says, As far as it be with Pete, with you, Paul's talking to the Romans. He says, As far as it be with you, he's preaching. He says, As far as you people, you Christians, <coughs> the world we give up on them. The world's different. They don't care. But we Christians have responsibility. <coughs> it's not okay to not be in a relationship. And as far as it be on your end, you need to do everything you can to restore, to reinstate, and try to do what you can to live in harmony with each other. <coughs> So, we've been talking about different ways, different tools on how to have a healthy relationships, how to resolve conflict in a healthy way that builds up the kingdom and edifies it instead of tears it down. The devil loves to tear down, but God loves to build things up. And so we've been learning how some tools on how to get along. And so, last time I was here, several weeks ago, we talked about the bombshell theory. How many of you were here now, how many were not here? Let me go that route. Okay, well, you're in for a treat because we're going to teach it again tonight. That sounds kind of weird, but uh, we didn't get a good recording last time, and we want to get a good recording, but that's not the only reason because I believe I prayed about it, and the Lord said, you know, let's go ahead and teach the whole thing again. Let's, I think it's that good. Amen. I believe that this, this bombshell theory... 
you know, when we talk of theories, well, that's, you know, I kind of feel like this could be a way, this could, you know, I'm, so I don't even like that word theory. I like the word bombshell principle because I believe uh, it's, it's an amazing principle. It's proven. I remember hearing this back at Duncan years, and over time I began to look at this bombshell theory, and I realized I'd never really taught on it, and I said, wow, this is, this is really, really good. Wish I could have learned this a few years ago, uh, and about taking ownership. That's what this is about. It's about taking ownership. It's not about worrying about the other people. This is about me. Me taking ownership. Me taking responsibility. If I learn about that, how to worry about me, and quit worrying about everybody else, and quit trying to change him and just change me, then uh, I would have, uh, and I probably would uh, have a lot more people that like me today, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but it's that amazing. So, uh, how many of you, uh, go ahead and put that up. We've got some more handouts. How many you need one? Hold it, raise your hand real fast, and we'll get, we'll get uh, somebody to run over and grab it and get you one. A little hard to read. Pull it down a little bit, bro. Right there. So one more. Mm -hmm. I guess that's supposed to be a bar. Huh? <laughs> How many of you ever got dropped a bar on your head? <laughs> How about a truth bomb? Spoke some truth into your life. Huh? Well, God loves to do that. But the bombshell theory or principle says I cannot change other people or another person by direct action. But I can, however, change myself. And the version I had, and I don't know where I got off here, it says uh, by God's grace. So I want you to write in there next to uh, I cannot change myself but by God's grace, because I think that's that takes it up to a whole new level. And I'll figure out which version. Anyway, let's just go with that. So I cannot change another person by direct action. I can change, however, myself by God's grace. Can't change ourselves, can we? And we can make change, we can do things, but genuine, true change really only takes place as we go to the cross. I can curb my behavior, I can try to do this, I can chew, but if, if, if I'm not changed down in the heart where it becomes my idea, then I'll just eventually go back to being the same old jerk I've always been. So if we really, really want to change, it takes my part, but then it takes God's part. It takes God's part, but it also takes my part. I can't do God's job and God's not going to do my job. Amen? So others have a tendency, and amazing things happen. Others have a tendency to change in re reaction to my change or in direct portion to my change. How much I change can have a huge impact and bearing on how much somebody else will change in a marriage. This is a principle here. It says, you know, the more I can change and take ownership, an amazing thing happens in direct proportion, others have a tendency to change in proportion to my change. So we're going to break this down and go over it again in three sections. So let's look at the first part of it. I cannot change or control or have the power of, uh, over another person by direct action. I cannot choose to enforce, dictate myself, or impose upon another person and have power over them. It just, it's not, it's not going to happen. So, number one, this is a, this is a fact of life. I, the fact is, how I many you know it is what it is? That's 
that's another one. I want to preach a whole series on that one day when the Lord released me. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Life is the way it is. People are, for the most part, the way they are. And I've got to realize that, you know, if I'm going to get along, uh, you know, I can be me. I can have my own convictions. I can be me and do what I can. But I'm never going to change the circumstances of life or other people. If I'm going to learn to get along with them, then I'm going to have to change and learn to live life on their terms to some degree. I never want to compromise my conscience or violate my conscience. I'm never going to do that. But you know, there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, you know, the Bible says, why not, be, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Why not rather, rather, rather be the bigger person? You know, hey, you know, I don't have to be right. I don't have to have my way. I mean, you know, this, these are huge steps of progression and maturity when we don't have to have our way. We don't have to have everything go there. How many of you are control freaks? I'm the only one. Let me ask you again. Anybody just be honest? Just a few, a few little control issues, all right? Well, there's healthy control and there's unhealthy control. We, we have to be in control of our marriage. We have to be in control of our kids. I have to be in control of my finances. I have to be in control of my house and my health. If not, then it's what you call a dysfunctional life. You know, I have to be in control of this ministry in a healthy way. That's my job. That's what I get paid for. I'm supposed to, to have control over things. I need to be watching the bills. I need to be paying attention to what my staff is doing. I need to be paying attention to how things are going. And that's what I do. But when, it be, when, but when that control becomes obsessive and possessive, when I get anal about it to the point where I can't relax, I can't rest, I have self-imposed anxiety, and I'm wrapped around the axle, bent out of shape, then, then that's weird. That's not good. That's unhealthy. That's sinful. And the enemy will eat that up. Some things you just can't control. So it's a fact of life. It is what it is. That life is life, and people are people. And I can't control or dictate them. I think one of the biggest fantasies, I talked to my sister one time and asked her about, now tell me about marriage, tell me about the reality. Goes, well, one thing, you, you don't never go into a marriage thinking you're gonna change somebody. Because, uh, you know, the reality is, with that, is they're probably not going to change. I think one of the biggest fantasies we live in is, well, uh, I'll just change it when we get married. He'll lose weight when we get married, or he'll quit being angry when I get married. He'll quit watching porno when we get married. Because let me just tell you, if you, let me just tell you, it is what it is. You got what you got. I mean, God changes and things happen, and that's good. But for the most part, if you go into there in fantasy. Expectations are just resentments waiting to happen. When you go into a marriage thinking you're going to change, that's fantasy, man. That's crazy. You're not going to, you know, pretty much you got what you want, and you need to go in with your eyes. They say go in into marriage with your eyes both wide open, and once you're married, have one eye shut. <laughs> because people are people, and life is life, and you're not going to change them. So if they hang their dirty underwear and, and on the floor and uh, don't, uh, Live neat and they're slob, then you're probably going to have a slob. That's probably what you got. So if this person is ever going to really change, I can't change in my direction, action, they're going to have to pretty much, it's going to have to become their idea, isn't it? I like this one. It says, a mind convinced against its will is of the same opinion still. Okay? I can tell a guy in the lodge you got a stinking rotten attitude and you better ship up or ship out or we're going to boat you off the island and uh, you know get with it and he can be court ordered and he can say okay well now I'm not going back to jail so uh, I'll go ahead and curb my behavior I'll do what I need to do to keep from getting booted out of here but and I'll sit down but I'm still going to be standing up in my heart so that mind you know, we can convince him to change you, but a mind that's convinced against his will, on his, it's not his idea, is going to really, in the heart, be of the same opinion still. You know, a wife can go up and say, honey, you know, if you don't quit doing this, if you don't quit doing this, you don't quit doing this, then we're going to get divorced, and 
you know, he can go through all those motions, but you know, if he doesn't really change in the heart, then what do you really, really have? What you really want is that person to take ownership and change because they want to change. I heard some movie one time where the girl finally came out to talk to her husband was watching TV. She says, you know, I just wish you would help me do dishes. I, I, I want you to want to help me do dishes. He looked at her cross eyed and said, well, why would I want to do dishes? <laughs> You know, that's crazy. What, what do you mean you want me to want to want to do dishes? I don't want to do dishes. It's insane. But she was really saying, I, I want you to come help me because you love me, not because of dishes, but you care about me. Yeah. But you know how men are, right? You know how right? Read between the lines. So people have to want to change. It has to become their idea or they're not going to change. How many have ever tried to play God? Take God off the throne, put him down here, and put you there. How many of you like to be God, play God over people, and, and be their Holy Spirit? You know, we do a lot of principles here in the program, and, you know, trying to impart a lot of principles here, and, and trust me, they don't work out there in a marriage. Okay? They don't. The things that I do in the program with the men don't work in the church, okay? People don't, don't, can't handle competition. They can't handle the truth and love. I mean, it's just it's a different thing. And I can't, and I, I'll never be somebody else's God, you know, but the Holy Spirit, they, they've got to, to if they're going to ever grow and change, they're going to have to make God their own Holy Spirit. And if you're trying to be God and play Holy Spirit, you know, you're, you're in the wrong profession. You're in a battle that you'll never win playing God. You're not God. And you never will be God, so quit trying to play God. Let go and let God. So I cannot change another person by direct action. However, number two, I can change myself by God's grace. We've been given the Holy Spirit who gives us Grace. Grace is the word charge. It's the Greek word charge. It means Holy Ghost empowerment. It does for me what I can't do for myself. Something that empowers me. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to be our help. I can't change this other person. Man, I'm more out. I'm trying. I'm going crazy. I'm a control freak. I got However, if I will stop and say, I can't change them, but, but I can change me. If I turn inwardly and reach down into the Holy Spirit and I separate myself and, and I take my focus off this person, and shift my focus back to me, and I turn inwardly and I tap into the Holy Spirit, God's grace is an amazing thing that empowers me, it enables me, equip, equips me, it allows me to do things that I could never do on my own. There's no way I'm going to change that person. There's no way I'm going to ever be able to live with this person. There's no way I'm going to ever be able to be married to this person. There's no way I'll ever be able to work with this person every single day the rest of my life unless something changes. So I can't change them. So Lord, by your grace, by your power, you can change me. That's why you, you're there. So there's hope. No matter how much you don't like somebody, or no matter how bad your marriage is, or who you're stuck working with, or who your boss is, you can't change, but you can change yourself. And as you change, then you're going to see something amazing happen, and they're going to change. So what we're talking here, fact number one is, uh, it is what it is. Number two is, is about ownership. I can't change them by direct action. However, I can take ownership of me. I can take responsible for me, responsibility for me. I can examine, do my own inventory. How many know we're really good about working everybody's inventory? Matter of fact, I'm not just good working their inventory. I work on their inventory, their inventory, their inventory, their. I'm real good at working on everybody's inventory. But when it comes to really dealing with my own inventory, taking ownership, responsibility, that's where we run into problems. And in. 
2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul's talking to his church, says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith or where you need to be in your journey. You don't need to quit worrying about where they're at in their journey. Their you need to worry about where you're at in your progress and in your journey. Are you bearing the fruits? Are you growing and dealing with yourself? You're not their God. You're responsible to your own God. You're not their God. You're not, you're not your servant. They're God. They belong to God. They're God's servant. Who are you to judge and examine and scrutinize the servant of another? They answer to their own master. The Amplified says, examine, test, evaluate your own selves to see whether you're holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourself not God. This is saying, uh, you know, your mama can't do it, your daddy can't do it, your preacher can't do it, and even God can't do it. This is something you're going to have to do. It's your job to find out how you're doing in your life with your issues, your stuff, your stinking thinking, your bad attitudes, your dysfunctional behavior, and your character defects. I don't have power or control over that person, but I do have control over me. I looked in the mirror one day and then looked at me and finally I went, oh, there's the problem. Okay, it always been the girlfriend or the buddies or the world or the TV just popped up on that channel, that porno channel, or that stem just ended up in my hand, or that needle just ended up in my arm, or I just ended up at ABC. No, you put yourself at ABC. You put the needle in your arm. You know? That you, you, you know, finally I realized, I took ownership, and I realized that my problem ended up the way I was. 38 years old, I'm in Dunkin' in a swamp, lost everything I had, and finally I realized it, you know, I had to, I had to finally own it and say, yeah, that, that's me. You are where you are because you put yourself there. You made the choices and you are laying in that bed, living in that bed and, and own it. I love what Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says. Is why or how is it that you look, gaze intently focus on the speck some versions say the particle that is in your own eyes or in your brother's eye, but you fail to notice, to recognize, or consider, or be aware of the big old log that is in your own eye. I love Jesus' humor here. This, this is you get to see uh, some sarcasm here. This, this is really cool. How is it, how can you say to your brother, how is it you can even have the audacity to go to your brother and say, brother, let me take the little speck or particle out of your eye and behold, you have a log in your eye. Let me just tell you what that, what that, what that is. This Jesus, I love, sorry, this, this, this Jesus is an extreme analogy here. Think about how silly and how stupid and how hypocritical would it be for me to go up to Brother Seth and, and here I've got this big old hawker in my eye, okay? <laughs> it's the closest thing I can find to a bean, but if you're talking a bean, we're talking about like a huge, okay? Uh, I went, couldn't quite carry that in here, so I found me a board. So it talks about a log or a beam or, okay? And what it's saying right there is, how silly would it be for me to go up and try to examine a little character defect, a little attitude, a little something with Brother Seth, and I said, Brother Seth, you know, you really need to take a look at yourself, bro. You know, you, you really, you really kind of stinking on this thing, and 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 yet he's looking at me and he sees this big old log in my eye. First of all, how in the world could I see to take the splinter out if I've got a big old beam in my eye? We're going to teach a message in a while called the clear eye. <clears throat> my, my, my glasses are foggy. I was on vacation and it was like down in the Keys, hot, hot, hot. It was like taking my sunglasses off and on because of the fog, you know. Constantly having to clean them. I mean, I couldn't see clear. I couldn't read, you know. And I had to constantly get a clear eye. I had to get my, you know, my glasses. And, and that's what it's talking about in the clear eye is, you know, we got to get, we got to get these 
character defects, these fears, and these things that we filter things through. We have these filters that we live through. That it's our own stuff, it's our own crazy stuff, and we have to be able to get those things, the resentments. That's why we got to clean up our heart. We got to get our resentments and our judgments and things out of the way so then we can see the minister. So Jesus says, man, that's, uh, that's the hypocrite. He says, first, why don't you, why don't you go over here and uh, get out your little mirror? And why don't you do a self inventory of yourself? Why don't you quit worrying about the specks and logs in your wife's eye, what she's doing, what she's not doing, what your kid. And why don't you start first by looking at yourself, doing an examination on yourself? Why don't you go over here and look at your issues? Your attitude, your steam, thinking all those logs in your eye. Let's get rid of that log. Let's get rid of this log. Let's get rid of that log. And then you might have some value or some credibility when you go to talk to your brother. So Jesus said, don't even come talk to me about my stuff. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and start trying to speak the truth and love to you? And you say, oh, brother, I wish you could just see the, you know, the big old booger hanging out of your nose right now. <laughs> You're talking to me about my little thing, and you're just like, I mean, that, that just, that's so hypocritical. It's two-faced. It's phony. And this is what Jesus is saying. Man, don't, don't stick your foot in your mouth. Don't saw off the branch you're sitting and Don't give up your, your power and Don't give up your, your credibility, man. Uh, you know, keep, do your own inventory. Quit working there. Do your inventory. And then, then you might be able to come back and be able to use by God to minister to somebody. So, I cannot change another person by direct action. However, I can take ownership of me. I can step back, go over here, get in my closet, and get into the mirror, and start really cleaning up my messes. Taking ownership. I do have power over me, right? I don't have no power over nobody else. But I do have power over me. Uh, you know? And I can make choices. You know, I can choose to what, eat what I want. I can choose what I put in my mind. I can choose. I mean, I have a lot of control over me, but I don't have no control over my. But I do have control over me. I was, uh, I love to tell this story. Some of you heard it. I was over at a Teen Challenge at Sanford, and they were having a leadership conference on inner healing. And uh, the guy even said, look, you know, there's 80 of you here or so, and uh, we're going to train you to train others by putting you through uh, the program. It's about three days. Intensive. So they got to the point where they said, let's break up into groups. So they put me in a group over here with about me and about six other pastors. I think every one of them was a pastor. They said, we want you to take turns and go around the room. They want you to share your character defects, your stuff, your, your, your logs. And I just have a sneaky feeling, man. So anyway, uh, everyone's just kind of looking at each other and scratching their head and getting a little nervous. And you can see their seats moving around. And, and you know, we were like, okay, let's, we're supposed to be sharing. Let's, let's get with us. Let's open up and start sharing. And I'm already doing my inventory around right here, right? I'm, re I'm rattling off. I'm ready to drop a big bomb on them. And finally, after... Seemed like forever. One guy said, well, sometimes I get a little impatient. And finally, the other guy said, yeah, I think I get a little impatient too. And this dog and pony show went around, and it was I was ready to barf. I almost had to dismiss myself. I'm thinking to myself, well, I can tell you, every one of you are liar, liar, pants on fire, because I know you're men, and I know you all have lust problems. So this, I'm thinking all this, but I didn't say it. So I just let them do the thing. So finally, it come around to me, and uh, I was kind of last, and Man, I just laid it all out here, baby. I was like, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that. And they're like, oh my God. Said, well, it is what it is, guys. It's me. And, uh, and then, you know what happened? Amazingly, they all started settling down. They go, yeah, you know, and, and they started getting real. They started getting honest. They started, they started getting, you know, and letting off that self-righteous religious spirit. One of the biggest problems we have in, in church today is hypocrites, that self-righteous religious spirit where we know we got stuff, but we don't want to own it. We want to look good. 
We want to save face. We don't want people to get to know who we really are. So I can't change another person direct by direct action. However, I can change myself by God's grace. Praise God, I have a helper. And something amazing. Others have a tendency to change in reaction to my change or in direct proportion to my change or in my ownership, they change. So the third one is something amazing happens. I can't change this person. That's just, they are who they are. They're like, uh, can't teach an old dog new tricks, can you? You know? And they pretty much are, so I can't change them. However, I can change myself. I can pull away. I can go over here and deal with myself. I can get the logs out of my eye. I can humble up. I can deal with me, focus on me. And as I change, then it says there's an amazing thing in proportion to the amount that I change. This person has a tendency to go over here and get in their closet and start changing. In other words, we're having a Mexican standoff, right? I don't like them. They don't like me. They don't agree with me. We're, we finally get to this point in our marriage where we got conflict. And it's a Mexican stand. We're getting nowhere. I'm trying to change and control them. They're trying to change. That's not going to work. It's a fact of life. Okay? Uh, and we got to take ownership. But as I pull away and I look at myself, then in proportion to the change, this person begins to observe and look at the links that I'm going to take ownership. They see my humility. They see me going to church. They see me getting the Bible out. They see me journaling. They see me getting. They see me doing what I'm doing. They're, they they have to start looking at themselves. They can't blame me. They they got to look and say, this guy's trying. This guy wants a better marriage. He wants to do it. He's taken care of. So after a while, unless they're a complete idiot or are really lost, somewhere they're going to start thinking, man, I do love this person. I do care about this marriage, this person. So maybe I need to start taking a look at me. And then as you're changing and working on you in your closet, and they're working on them in their closet, over a period of time, an amazing things happen. Two people start coming together and they start learning how to get along. When we shift our focus and take ownership and quit worrying about them as I begin to love them and accept them for who they are and quit trying to control them. I've had this happen in an amazing way in my life since I really started studying this and especially over the last few months. You know, but over the years, uh, there's been people in my life that I just, you know, I mean, I love them, but I didn't like them, and but I had to be around them. I had to work with them or play ball with them or work in the same cubicle or, you know, could be your mother, could be your dad, or I know some of us have a hard time just being around our parents, right? Have you ever thought about, well, maybe quit trying to change your parents and just change you and how you handle yourself when you're with them by God's grace? So that when you get around your parents, they don't drive you crazy so much because you've changed and they just don't bother you. I've seen this happen so many times when I finally gave up and said, man, that person's probably never going to change. They are who they are. And I begin by God's grace and they put a love in my heart. An ability. God's love was shed around. And now I start able to see them differently. I can love them for who they are and for the way they are. And I can almost start laughing about it. And they may have never changed, but I changed so it got all better. And now they're some of my best friends today. But there's been a bunch of times when I humbled up and I did what I needed to do and I came back. Then that person says, you know, uh, I've been a jerk. I've been this too. And, you know, I've got some things I need to work on. And, and, and then all of a sudden, what do you have? There's not a Mexican standoff. Now you're in a win-win situation. It's hard to offend a humble person. So no one ever got punched in the face, most likely for coming up and saying, I'm sorry, I could have done this better. Will you forgive me? I'd like to do it better next time. And, uh, and, and, and quit saying, but you need to do this. And but you know, no, no, just own your stuff. And most of the time when they see that true humility coming from the heart, they just look at it and they all of a sudden they just start melting. They see you come back and all of a sudden they've got that pride up. They're putting their thing on. They're ready for a war, ready for round number three. And they see now that you've changed and you're humble. 
you spent time with the Lord, now you've gotten spiritual, now you're coming back because you love me. Say, man, I care about you, I care about this relationship, I want to get along. How can we do that? Will you forgive me? And that person almost has to melt unless they have no character at all. So, Tim, stand up here real quick. So here's Mr. Tim. He's a know-it-all, isn't he? Yeah. Not really. I'm just... <laughs> Mr. Self-righteous. He got no problems. I'm like one of them pastors. I got it all good. I'm all arrived. I've done that. I can't stand this guy. He gets under my armor. He gets under my skin. He gets me in reaction. I just want to go nauseated. I just don't like this dude. I mean, I love him and I want to try, but I just don't like him. You know, this guy is who he is. Okay? So I can focus all day on trying to change him or I can just say, Lord, this is not right. This person is the way they are. I turn them over to you. I let go and I let God. I'm going to come over here and get them here. I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to get my heart, my heart right attitude. You know, and then I'm going to come back with humility and say, Tim, I'm not going to say you self-righteous guy that thinks you know it all. You stink. I, I'm, I'm not even going to go. I'm just going to say, you know, uh, you, know you, really, you, you were a good guy. You know, here's some hope for you. No, I'm going to point out the positive thing without lying. You know, I'm going to stretch it a bit and uh, blow, you know, fluff it up a little bit to some degree. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to go back and, and show genuine care and concern because I've gotten spiritual. I've taken a look. It may be hard. I may be biting my lip, but by God's grace, I'm doing this. And, you know, uh, and I'll say, I just love you. Can we pray? And how can I, how, what can I do for you? And then I just walk away about my day. I've done my part. As far as it be with me, I've been with peace with all men. Now, what do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to run over here and punch me? Or do you think possibly he's going to go home and scratch your head and say, man, that guy's been an a-hole. He's thinking, he's thinking about me. He's that self-righteous guy that thinks he knows it all and he's done all that. I wonder when he's going to change when he's doing all that. And I'm thinking the same thing about him. What good is that? But now he's going to see my spirit change. My attitude, my heart. Now he's going to have to do something with that. And chances are he's going to have to uh, do something about him and he's going to have to humble he's going to have to take some ownership and amazing things happen and this is about go ahead you can sit down this is about this is about how God does things so you're not going to find I cannot change another person by direct action I can only change myself by God's grace others have a tendency to change in my reaction to my change you're not going to find that in Proverbs okay but somebody had something going on when they wrote this so there's two, two tools. How much time? Am I all right? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Okay. Real quick. Two tools. Serenity prayer, number one. This is the shorty, and I got the longie if you want one. They're in the back back there. I've had the guys in the program memorize this, and I say it every day. Every day. Maybe once or twice, but mostly every single day. The long word. God, help me. I can't change this other person. I know you need to change me by God's grace. Grant me the serenity or the tranquility or the inward disposition, the character qualities of meekness to accept the things or the people I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can and then give me the wisdom to know the difference. Lord, I... I need to get along. I need to love everybody. I need your serenity. I need your Holy Spirit. By God's grace, help me to accept other people the way they are, Lord. Help me to accept them. Give me the courage to change the things about me. Help me to let go and let God let me take ownership. Let me do my own inventory. And give me the wisdom to know what I can change and what I can't change. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, go ask God. He gives to all generously without reproach and it will be given to him. What that says right there, you don't need to sit around scratching your head trying to, to figure out what to do with another person. Go ask him. <coughs> he knows your wife. Okay? He knows your husband. Better than way, but have you ever thought about going to the Lord and say, I don't understand my wife. She, I just don't, you know, I can't do it. But you know her. You intricately wove her in the, in the, the womb and you you designed her. You know her from the head. You know her better than she does. She's my wife. You gave her to me. Have you ever thought about going to God and saying, Lord, would you teach me how to love her? Would you teach me how to love her her way and to do things, you know, 
Would you, would you anoint me to cultivate, to bring out the best in it? Would you anoint me to get into his head and heart? Would you anoint me to be able to say just the right things at the right time and buy the right things and be there? Would you just, I mean, do you think that's the coolest prayer in the world? Have you ever thought of your wife about, Lord, this guy's a jerk, man. I can't figure him out why he does what he does, Lord, but you gave him to me and I'm stuck with him, Lord. He's the priest in the home. i got to submit. I don't like it anymore, but would you, would you help me, Lord? Show me how to be a good wife. Show me how to let, let my adornment not be merely external, but help me allow it to be the inward person, the heart. Let me develop that inward disposition that's submissive and subservient and respectful despite whether they deserve or not. Help me with that. Give me the grace to do that. Teach me how to love him and do things. And I mean, this, this is how we get somewhere, folks. Humility. Humility. Last one, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. This is a love's prayer. I pray this one pretty much every day. Be anxious, don't be over have be over have anxiety, overly concerned about anything. Nothing. But in everything you do, everything in life and every person you deal with, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Lord, I gotta live with this person. I want to get along. I want to save my marriage. I wanna I wanna deal with this. I want to represent you. I want to be Christ-like. That's my request. It's an honoring prayer. Then it says something amazing. Have the peace or the irony of God. God's peace. Not something you work out, but God's peace comes on you. A peace that surpasses all comprehension and it will guard your hearts and your minds. The two battlefields. Lord, I turn it over to you, baby. I can't fix that person. I can't fix me. I want to work on me. You work on them. Lord, I just I turn it over. It's up to you. You're God. I'm not. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I turn it over to you with prayers. Lord, I'm going to keep praying and keep praying. I'm going to go, instead of worrying about it, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to keep changing. I'm going to keep changing. And it says that peace comes on you and it puts this guard over your mind and over your heart. I was talking, talking to a guy on the phone today. Uh, he was laid up in bed. Couldn't even get out of bed because he was in such turmoil and agony because his wife's Leaving them and they're getting divorced and 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 he was like he was talking like he might be suicidal. I was getting a little really really worried and he said, "I don't know what it is about this girl. I don't know what it is. And she's got power over me. I can't quit thinking about it. every time I even talk to her, text her, she just has power over me. I just I go in strong and then I fall apart and I just don't know. I'm I'm falling up crazy. He was in turmoil. He was in agony because he had a stronghold, a deeply ingrained habit pattern of doing business where the devil was eating him up to the point where he was you know could die. This is a, this was a pastor." He's not in ministry anymore. So we pray. I don't know how it helped, but I know that if he would just turn this thing over to the Lord and step away from it and quit trying to be the Holy Spirit and be God, that God's peace would come and guard his heart and his mind and things would be more better. Amen? Amen. All right. Next week we're going to carry on with part two of this. So we'll see you. See you.